Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> uh, welcome to the Danube Institute. My name is John O'Sullivan. I'm the uh, president of the Institute. Um, now, I've just done a quick count here, and I think this afternoon, as far as I'm concerned, is a massively interesting um, introduction to the generation gap. I think if I were to do an average age estimate of the population here, uh, multiply it by three, I would still be older. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm therefore kind of a strange in a strange land, and I'm um, looking forward very much to hearing what Will has to say. But I want to tell a quick story by way of uh, introduction. Uh, he will introduce himself, but about 40 years ago, when I'd recently become the editor of National Review magazine, into my office one day came our literary editor, a man called David Klinkhofer, now a distinguished scholar in the West Coast. And he said, John, there's a fellow on the radio, and he's really making tremendous inroads into the broadcasting world. Um, everybody is listening to him. He's changing minds. He's turning a whole group of people who've never really been interested in politics before into solid conservatives. I said, oh, well, that's very interesting. And he said, well, I want you to meet him. In fact, I've arranged a dinner. I said, what do you mean? He said, I said, well, he's going to turn up at your favorite restaurant on Tuesday at 8 o'clock, and I want you to be there. And I said, uh, why? He said, because I think this man is a kind of cutting edge of American radio broadcasting in future, and he will change the country. He's that important. Not that many people know him now, but they will, millions will know him soon. And I said, OK, well, I trust your judgment, David. I'll go. By the way, what's the guy's name? He said, his name is Rush Limbaugh. Well, I went to um, that dinner, and Rush, of course, became the single most important um, broadcaster in the United States. He did so, um, in, not only that, became, I would say, the single most influential individual in the United States on the political side, bringing people to the right. He was, before the term was really used, he was an influencer. Now, that is what Will Witt is. Now, I'm new to the word influencer, uh, and I'm going to leave it him to explain. But I do know some of the things he's done, because I know Prager University, and I admire greatly the university and its founder. And I know also uh, that Will is addressing one of the most important topics um, in our current political world, and one that needs your interest and commitment to solving. Um, now, that makes it sound a great deal more solemn than I think this afternoon is going to be, but that topic is, is leftism a religion? Because those of us who've, over the years, watched the de development of politics and of wokery, uh, we are very, very concerned by that question. So, Will, I want to thank you for coming. I'm handing over the things to you now. Um, you will speak, you will be your own chairman later. I'm gonna be sitting there listening, and I think I'm gonna be, um, I think I'm gonna be listening to the next Rush Limbaugh, but that's for you to prove. Thank you. My speech is about five seconds long. Is leftism a religion? Yes. And now I think we can all go home, right? This one work? Is this one? I can, you can use this one? Okay, good. I, I am truly honored today to be here in Hungary and to speak to all of you guys. It's truly the, the biggest blessing in my life. This is my first time ever outside of the country, outside of America. So t to be here in Hungary, all of the things that you hear. I mean, you guys, if you know anything about America and what they say about Hungary, you'll know that if you only read the New York Times, they hate Hungary. They think it's this terrible fascist dictatorship. Everyone here is brainwashed and it's this concentration camp. I mean, just a terrible place you'll hear from the left-wing media, right? And you'll hear Tucker Carlson talk about it on the other side, how much he loves it. You'll hear Dennis Prager talk about it, how much he loves Hungary. But aside from those two sides, I have to be honest with you, you actually don't hear too much about Hungary. 
You would expect that when you read these things, you must think that everyone's talking about Hungary. But if I were to go, you guys have seen any of my videos where I go around on campuses or on the streets of LA and I go and talk to people. If I were to say, hey, where's Hungary on a map? They would have no idea. They'd probably point to somewhere in Africa. They would, they, they would have no idea where Hungary is. But that's the world we live in and there's a purpose to that. There's a purpose to why people in America know nothing about Hungary because Hungary survived communism. And communism is something in America today that is seen as a beautiful thing. I mean, we have members of Congress in America who are openly communist, who are openly socialist, who come and say that we want a Green New Deal, we want to build back better. You guys might have heard something like that here that is similar. They want to take over the country in their new socialist paradise. And so myself, what I do in America is making sure that these people do not succeed. My business card says vanquisher of evil on it. I think that communism is evil and the things that these people push for, and I will do everything I can to stop it. And so my story, if you guys haven't heard of me before, maybe you've heard of PragerU. I grew up in Colorado, which is a state in America. I don't know if I have to explain this. It was funny. I was talking with Ava before this, uh, my girlfriend Ava here, wonderful voice as well in the Netherlands. And I was asking her, like, can I tell jokes during my speech? She was like, well, they might not get your jokes. And I'm like, well, I'm already not very funny in America. So this is going to be a train wreck here. But I grew up in Colorado and I was a liberal atheist my entire life. I was mostly more liberal or more atheist, I guess you could say. I, I thought Obama was pretty cool because he was black. And that was about the extent of my politics, right? And, but I was very atheist and I would go around to people and tell them just how terrible God was, how stupid religion was. And my senior year of high school, which I don't know if the grading system is the same, that's a year before college, uh, I, I went and worked for this Democrat senator. And I mostly did it to impress this girl who I knew, but I, I was also on the left. And after that, I went to college at the University of Colorado Boulder and everything changed for me. Everything changed when I actually went to college and I started to see how intolerant all of these people were to anyone who had a different point of view. I was in a sociology class, which was a useless class, and I was an English major, which was a useless degree, and there was a black girl sitting next to me, right? And my teacher in the class, we're talking about white privilege and how bad capitalism is and all of that, and she comes up to me and she points at the black girl sitting next to me and she says, you are oppressing this girl next to you because of the color of your skin. And this was a defining moment for me because this girl was my friend and we looked at each other and we're both just like, I don't know what's going on here. This is really, really awkward for the both of us. And I didn't feel like I was oppressing someone and she didn't feel like she was being oppressed. But this teacher at this $50,000 a year university gets to come and tell me that I'm oppressing someone. This is how you create the victim culture in America, the victim culture that we now have that permeates every single aspect of what we do in that country. And so after that, I decided to get very involved. I started researching politics every single day. I would skip my classes and I would go on campus and I would set up a table and I would just go and debate kids on all sorts of things, abortion, uh, capitalism, socialism, climate change, any of these types of things, I would go and debate students when I should have been in class. And so because I'd never went to class, I ended up dropping out of school. And I found out about PragerU. I heard their videos and I decided to make my own video for PragerU, where I went and debated women on the wage gap. That's the patriarchy right there. And I, I asked these women what they thought about, and of course they all thought they were incredibly oppressed and how terrible it was. And I taught myself how to edit the video, shoot the video. I sent it to PragerU. They ended up loving it. And long story short, they offered me a job after two years of college, dropped out to move to Los Angeles, where I live now, making the videos for PragerU and doing everything I can. So that's how I got to where I am. And that was about four years ago. And to think that now, again, that I'm here speaking across the world to, to all of you, truly, I, I can't say enough how, how much of a blessing it really is for me to be here. And I know that this is God ordained. I know that it is, because like I said, I was an atheist my entire life. Be telling people how stupid God was was my impo most important thing that I did every single day. And it all changed when I started becoming a conservative. And you guys are, might be familiar with the Founding Fathers of America. The Founding Fathers of America and our Constitution founded our country knowing that you don't get your rights from the government, you don't get your morality from the government, you get your rights from God. You have inalienable rights endowed on you by your creator. There is no other country in the world that was founded like America was, right? And that was the first step for me. 
And the second step to becoming a Christian was during the COVID pandemic and everyone was locked down and things were terrible and I was somewhat bored. I decided, well, I'm bored. I guess I'll read the Bible, right? That's a, a good thing to do. And so I decided to read the four gospels. I said, enough is enough. I'm not just going to keep playing around with this. So I read the four gospels of the Bible and I said, okay, now that I have read this, I have to make a choice. And I said, if Jesus really did die for my sins, everything that is within that text, then I have no choice but to give my life to him. And so a year ago, actually a year and one week ago, I gave my life to Christ. I was baptized in Huntington Beach, California. And now I have put everything that I do, faith comes first, the faith drives the politics. And from what I hear about Hungary, that seems to be the way that it is here. Is that correct in assuming fairly? I think that's a beautiful thing. Because in America especially, we have so many people who are driven by the politics instead of being driven by what's actually true. And there's a big difference there. There's a big difference there. I mean, we have a lot of people who are on the right wing, a conservative party in America, who don't drive forward truth at all. It's just all about politics. And so when we talk about leftism as a religion, it's, it's a values problem in America that we have. And here as well, all across the world, in, in, in the, de the developed world, we have values issues where people don't actually know truth and they don't think that truth is a good thing. You know, Nietzsche said, God is dead and we have killed him. And a lot of people, atheists, they'll come and they'll say, oh, well, you know, this is a congratulatory message. Nietzsche was applauding that God was dead, but that's not what he meant. What he meant is that because God is now dead, people will have to find some sort of value system to fill that void that was left by Christianity. And that is where leftism comes in. I don't know how, how familiar you guys are with Black Lives Matter here, if you guys have the protesters. In America, Black Lives Matter won the Nobel Peace Prize after they went and destroyed businesses for an entire summer. Uh, this is, Dr. Fauci gets a documentary made about him. I, this is the world that we live in now, where good is seen as evil and evil is seen as good. But Black Lives Matter, back last summer, you would have to post a black square on your Instagram. You guys remember that? To show that you weren't racist, <laughs> to show that you liked black people or something like that, you know? And what happened if you, if you didn't post that black square? You're ostracized. You're told that you're a racist. You're told that you're a terrible person. You know, when I was becoming a Christian and I was an atheist my whole life, the Christians who I met were some of the nicest people I've, I've ever had the pleasure to come in contact with. They were welcoming. I mean, I was walking into church as an atheist and there were these two older women and they're both pulling my arm saying, no, come sit by me, come sit by me, right? You know, that, that's how it was when I, when I was becoming a Christian. I think about the religion of leftism. If you don't align with their dogma 100%, then you are shamed. You are a terrible person. You are cast out of the religion. It's a religion based on guilt. And that is why it has become so popular for people. Because a religion that is built on people's nihilism that they now have. As Christianity has declined in the West, nihilism has become the dominant force. And people nowadays, especially again in America, they're very scared of death. People are very scared of death and what's going to happen. And they think that life is meaningless. And so this leftism, a Black Lives Matter, a, a COVID pandemic, a climate catastrophe, any of these types of ideals give people's lives a sense of meaning. Where they should be looking to truth from God, they look to meaning in themselves. And we have become a very vain and selfish culture. I'm not sure how many of you guys have read Brave New World. Brave New World is one of my favorite novels. I read it uh, just about after the COVID pandemic started, and it was a life-changing novel where if you guys are familiar with the dystopia that is within the work, essentially you have people who are dependent on the government, there is no more family, everyone's addicted to this drug called Soma, which makes you feel good, and, and the, there is no ownership of anything, right? You have orgy-porgy, the things that they talk about in the book. And what America looks like and the rest of the West looks like is getting closer and closer to a brave new world ideal where people have put so much reliance in their government and on their own individual religion that they have taken and made that the pinnacle of their values. Instead of looking to truth, they look to that. And you know, it, it's great that I have so many people here who, you know, I was very surprised that there were this many people in Hungary who even knew who I was. Or maybe they paid you guys to be here like the, the protesters of most of the rallies in America, you know? But I was very surprised because I, I've, I've done some events where I've not been greeted by such wonderful people. 
I did an event for my book tour a couple of months ago, this was in September, uh, at University of Maryland, which, which is just outside of Washington, D.C. If you know anything about Washington, D.C., it's very, very liberal. It's the most left-wing place basically in the country. And D.C. is basically just Los Angeles for ugly people. So I, I just hate going there. I, I did this event. And it was for my book tour, and we sold about 250 seats. It was, it was a quite a large event. And these protesters showed up. And they're coming, and they're outside, and I have security with me. But I say, hey, security, like, stay here. I don't want to intimidate these people. And so I go out there, and I go, and I try and talk to them. And I say, hey, I am sure that conservatives have said some lies about you, and I'm sure that the left has said some lies about me. So why don't we have a conversation and talk about this and see what, what kind of agreement that we can come to, right? And what did they do? They screamed at me, they yelled obscenities at me, horrible, vulgar things at me. I said, we sold out the ticket. We had people waiting in line to come and hear me speak. And I still cleared out a row and said, all of you guys on the left, you can come. You can be first in line for the Q&A. You can come and ask questions. I, I cleared this out for you. Not one of them showed up. Not one of them showed up to come and talk to me. One of them did have a sign, though, that was on notebook paper that said, Will Witt is a racist and a liar. It couldn't even get it on, on card stock. I did another event at a University of New Mexico, and I did my whole speech, and it was great and everything, and then I go on Twitter after the event, and there's a guy who's tweeting all of the things that I said during the event, and basically coming and saying all these things are horrible, saying I'm a Nazi, saying I'm a racist. And it's, he was there at the event. He heard the things I said. He could have come up during the Q&A and asked me any sort of question or accused me of being a Nazi to my face. He could have done any of these things, but he didn't do any of it. He just went and complained like a baby on Twitter. I did another event at University of Northern Colorado, and they told me that I had to wear a mask while I spoke. And I said, Ugh, you got another thing coming, buddy. No way, and uh, I did this event, and there's about 50 Black Lives Matter protesters there, and once I took my mask off to, to not do it, they came and destroyed the event. They flipped tables, they screamed at me, they, did all, they were threatening the people who were there to come and hear me speak, and eventually the police come, and I say, well, thank God, the police are going to come and put an end to these people, and they come up to me and say, well, you have to leave because you didn't wear a mask while you spoke. <laughs> I'm the dangerous one, right? But after that, I didn't take no for an answer, and I took about the remaining 200 people who were there to come and hear me speak. I took them off school property, on the street, right next to the university, and I gave them that speech in the snow and the cold, because we are not going to be silenced by any of these people. Thank you. Now, Dennis has a, a favorite verse, Dennis Prager, a favorite verse in the Bible, Genesis 1-1, God created the heavens and the earth. And this is so important because what God did here is not just create things, but he created order out of chaos, out of nothingness. God created order. The left loves chaos. They thrive on chaos. Their new religion is chaos. Socialism, communism, that is chaos. Saying that men can, can have their periods, that's chaos, right? Saying that, that America is an inherently racist country, that is chaos. Why is it that, that millions of immigrants from Africa are coming to America because we're a racist country? No, black Africans are coming to America because they know that there is nowhere better in the world for them to live. The opportunity for them is better than anywhere else in America. Or the founding fathers, many of you guys, you might not be aware of this, the original Declaration of Independence in America where it says life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it used to say life, liberty, and property. But the founding fathers changed it away from property because they did not want slaves, which at the time were seen as property, to be seen as a God-given right to you. This is how smart these guys were, how smart the founding fathers were. And they knew this all the way back then. America was founded as a country to get rid of slavery, not to enforce slavery. America is not a racist country. All of these things that they push for is chaos. And they destroy every single thing that they touch. I, you guys... Again, you guys live here in Hungary. You guys know what radical leftism and, and communism can do to a country, what it can do to a civilization. And it doesn't take very long to happen. It'll happen in the blink of an eye. I mean, look at the, the power that has been taken from us just by this COVID pandemic during the last two years. I mean, America, are in so many ways, in places like California or New York, where I live, 
It's, it's a radically different country. I don't recognize my country anymore. And it can happen so fast through government bureaucracy and leftism. Every single thing that they touch has been destroyed. I grew up in, in Colorado, like I said, and I grew up and my, my dad was never in the picture. And so for me, I joined the Boy Scouts of America. I don't know if you guys have a similar program here, anything like that, but I joined the Boy Scouts of America and that was, if it wasn't for the Boy Scouts, I wouldn't be here talking to you guys right now. It was the most amazing thing for me growing up as a boy. It taught me leadership, masculinity, how to be a role model, how to be a leader. And now I would never tell my son to join the Boy Scouts. I would never tell them. I mean, now it's just Scouts because they started letting girls in to the Boy Scouts. They now have essentially a wokeness merit badge in the Scouts. And the left has destroyed the Boy Scouts, something that has been an institution in America for over 100 years. And they have radically destroyed it. Have they created any sort of alternative to the Boy Scouts? No, they haven't created anything. You know, or think about something like late night TV in America. We have people, I used to love watching Conan O'Brien, if you guys are familiar with who that is, uh, among some of the other, Jay Leno. These were great men who made great TV. And now you have Stephen Colbert, who comes on his show dancing around with people in vaccine costumes. I mean, it's just propaganda. All of it is propaganda that you are watching on these screens. And have they created any sort of alternative to these things that they have destroyed? No. All they know how to do is destroy. And if you speak out against it, then they want to cancel you. The leftism as a religion thrives on canceling. It thrives on cancel culture. What is cancel culture? Cancel culture is mediocre people who have never thought of a new or novel idea in their entire life trying to destroy people because they've never thought of anything great. That is what cancel culture is. It is a system based off of envy, of brave and passionate people coming and saying the things that they're not supposed to say. Someone like Viktor Orban, who comes and does radically different things than anyone else is doing. And people all over my country, all over Europe, they want to destroy him because he is radically transforming Hungary and will continue to. But they want to cancel him for that because they are envious of what he is doing. They are envious of someone like a Tucker Carlson in America, or a Dennis Prager, or a me, or an Ava, or any of the people who are standing up for freedom and doing amazing things. Because they want to be a part of the herd. Nietzsche talks a lot. Uh, you guys will hear me quote Nietzsche a lot. I love Friedrich Nietzsche. He's my favorite philosopher. I know he was a big atheist and everything, but there's still a lot of good there. And he talked about the herd, the herd of people, the herd morality, right? And that is when you have people coming together who would rather be safe in the herd than actually think for themselves and think for truth. It's easier to cancel people if you feel like you are in the majority. If you see someone being an individual and coming and speaking out on their own and saying something that is different or new or bold or brave or passionate, then it's easy to cancel them so that they don't hurt your place in the majority. But I'm a big fan of unpopular opinions. I love unpopular opinions. When I do my show, I do my show every day on PragerU, I, I tell my producer, I say, hey, find the stories with the least amount of views. I wanna talk about these stories because these are the stories that get me going the most, not just the, the red meat things that people are talking about all the time. If you think about the founding of America, this was a handful of guys handful of guys, the founding fathers, who came and said, we are going to get away from the British Empire and start something incredible, start something new. And it was totally radical. If the founding fathers were alive today, they would be banned off Twitter immediately, okay? But because they were around back then, they were able to do something great. They were brave men, a handful of guys who came and started the greatest country to ever exist. Sorry, I have to say that, okay? <laughs> Second greatest country, if you, if you would like has started America, the, the, the beacon of freedom across the world with the greatest values created in any documents by any country ever before. And that was because no one agreed with what they were trying to do, but they did it anyway because they knew that the truth was on their side. That's a very powerful thing to me. You know, and these were also very deeply religious men and they prayed. You know, I'll hear a lot of people talk about praying and how it's antiquated and, and you don't need to pray anymore. And I think about Harriet Tubman in America, if you guys are familiar with that, uh, the abolitionist. She was an abolitionist who took black slaves in America and led them to the North to freedom. An amazing woman, right? She had a pistol in her pocket, but she also, when she didn't know where to go, she would get on her knees and she would pray and she would ask God where she's supposed to go next. 
It's a beautiful thing to me. These are powerful, strong, brave, independent individuals who did things that no one else was doing. And because of them being brave in the face of a tyrannical majority, as Tocqueville would say, they were able to accomplish incredible things. So when we are going out there and, and talking about this and, and standing up for ourselves, I know that it's very difficult to think that, well, because no one else agrees with me, I must be wrong or I must not speak up for what I believe in because no one else agrees with me. But that is the wrong frame of mind, my friend. The right frame of mind is knowing what the truth is and knowing that no matter even if other people agree or disagree, you are going to do it anyway. There's nothing more important in our entire lives than the pursuit of truth. And that is what we have to do every single step of the way. Because these people on the left, they love to lie. Okay? They lie about practically everything. I'm not sure. I know I'm referencing many things in America. But I am an American. So I will. Sorry, guys. I'm going to have to deal with it. Uh, do you guys remember there was a picture of a guy at the U.S. border and he was apparently whipping migrants? And you guys remember this picture? He was on a horse and he had his, the reins of his horse and apparently he was whipping migrants. Maxine Waters, a congressman from California, compared it to modern day slavery. I've met a lot of horses and none of them are really that racist and now they are banning horses at the border. <laughs> it's a ridiculous statement. But this was a complete lie. No migrants were being whipped at the border. What actually happened is that these are the reins of the horses. It's quite simple, right? But it made its way onto Twitter with a picture, and then it's made its way to the mainstream media, and then to Congress, then to the press secretary of the White House, and then it made its way to Joe Biden. And Joe Biden launched an investigation into the careers of these men who were just trying to keep America a sovereign nation, you know? Oh, no, you can't keep America a sovereign nation, but let's make sure that Ukraine is a totally sovereign nation. That's where we're at right now. They care a lot more about that border than they care about our border here, or our border in America. You know, but they lied about it. And because they lied about it, they were able to convince millions of people that standing up for your own border, for your own country's sovereignty, is a racist and terrible thing to do. And if you do it, you're probably a racist, you're probably a Nazi, and you probably want to go around whipping black people to send them back to their country. That is the message that they send when they lie to people. And that is why we are so divided in this country, because the mainstream media is the biggest enemy of the people. I mean, the mainstream media is basically just the, the wing of the leftists. That's all it is. These people don't serve any greater moral truth agenda. They don't actually speak out for the little guy like they used to. This isn't Upton Sinclair's jungle. This is, these are people who are taking their control over the minority because they know they can, because they know they have the money to do so. I mean, everything with the COVID pandemic and how the mainstream media has lied about everything. There were things, I know I can't talk too much about this, so I will self-censor myself a little bit. But there are things that I was saying six, eight months ago about the masks, about the efficacy of all these different things. And I was banned off Twitter. I was banned off of TikTok, which thank God I was banned off of TikTok. Shadow banned all over my social media. I lost a lot of my reputation in a lot of conservative circles for the things that I said because I was too extreme for many of them. And now what happens? Six months later, everything I said was right. And that's how it's gone with all of this, is that the people who were those individuals who spoke out with truth at the beginning are justified in everything that they said because they know that even though they stood alone, they stood for truth. It's an incredibly powerful thing. There are a few people like that. And it's a rare thing to see, but those are the most important people that we have in our country, that we have across the world. Many people who are on the right also lie. I would like to say that many people on the right are also a part of this religion of leftism. Okay? It's, it's not just a, a left-wing thing because these people who are conservatives adopt the, the left-wing talking points. What we say in America is that conservatives are just leftists driving the speed limit. That's what we call it. You know, in 2016, we had the presidency of America and we had both houses of Congress, the Senate and House of Representatives. And, you know, don't even think about getting Planned Parenthood defunded or, or don't even think about getting abortion outlawed. We couldn't even get Planned Parenthood defunded with a Republican majority in our country. We have Republicans who are taking money from Google 
Google is silencing people's voices all across the world. Google is sponsoring terrorist regimes. Google is telling people that it's okay. They, they say, oh, it's fine that we put information out there on how to smuggle people across the border. But if you put out something about bad testing sites for COVID, then you get banned off YouTube, right? But there are videos on YouTube and sites on Google where you can go and find out how to get someone smuggled across the US-Mexico border. These are evil people at Google. And Republicans, the conservatives, are taking money from them. Prager Yu, who I work for, is suing Google for restricting our videos. And you're gonna take money from them? How can you say that you are on my side if you are working with the enemy? I, I, I just have to say this now. I don't care if you're you know, more on the left, if you're more on the right. What really matters to me is that you love good things and you hate evil. That's truly the most important thing to me. If you love good things and you want to see evil be destroyed, then listen, you and I can have a lot to talk about. But if you actually love evil things, even if you don't know it, and you hate the good things, then my job is to destroy every single thing that you believe in. That is to be all of our jobs, to destroy evil. So I don't care what, what you identify as. I care what you want to destroy and what you want to uphold. We were walking off the, the planes today, and this was very shocking to me. It was quite nice. The, what is that called? The jet bridge? The jet bridge had signs on it that said uh, in all different languages about how family-friendly Hungary is. I loved that. It was such a refreshing thing to see that there is a country out there who supports the values of, of family values. You know, in America today, we have divorce rates at an all-time high. Uh, Black Lives Matter said they want to destroy the Western nuclear family as we know it. And to know that there are still places like Hungary across the world that have seen evil, that know what good is, and want to uphold the good things in the world is a beautiful, beautiful thing. It really is. Again, I can't tell you how blessed I am to be here. It's, it's, it's really got me. It's really got me. You guys ever heard of Goya beans? Yeah? Goya beans is a, a bean company, obviously. And the, the president of Goya beans, a couple of years ago, I think about two years ago, came out at the White House and said, I love Trump, I love Trump, he's the best. And after that, every single left wing, I was gonna do a Mexican accent, but I don't know, you know, I don't want to offend. I don't think there's any Mexicans here, but you know, in America, especially Los Angeles, I always have to watch out for that. So, uh, but, but after he said that, all the left wing media outlets, they come and they're against him and they say how terrible he is and you know, oh, he's anti-Mexican and it's like this guy is Mexican and you have some white journalist from San Francisco writing about how he's anti-Mexican. And it's like, yeah, for the first couple days, the blowback for this guy from Goya Beans was pretty bad. But two days after that, what happened? Every conservative in America went out and bought Goya Beans. I didn't even know what Goya Beans was. I don't even like beans. And I went and bought three cans of beans. If, you look, if any of you guys have ever watched my show, you will see that I have a can of Goya Beans behind me on my set for everyone to see because I want to show the support. And this is a very, this is, this is an important tactic that I, that I really want to put into people now that you understand that it seems really difficult when you stand up and you think, well, people are going to hate me. I mean, all these people on the left, I'm going to lose my job or I'm going to, you know, lose these friends or a spot at university or, or my people, even in my family are going to disregard me. But the people who you find after when you start speaking up for truth and speaking up for good things are going to be the best people that you ever find. I mean, I, I don't speak to really anyone from my days in college, really in Colorado at all anymore, but that's been okay with me. My relationship with my family is better than ever. I have fantastic conservative friends who align with my values, the, the best job ever. I have the greatest girlfriend in the world who's just as strong as I am, if not stronger. I have to tell her to calm down most of the time. But I have all these things because I've decided to stand up for truth everywhere I see it, even if people hate me for it and despise me for it. And that is how we fight back against the religion of leftism, is not by being coy and, and meek and tiresome. It's by being strong 
and brave. You know, there's this element of Christianity now. If you go to a lot of churches where Christians will come and talk and say, you know, just pray that, you know, these things go away. We have to pray that these struggles in our life, they go away. That's like, no, that's not what Christianity is about. You're not praying for an easy life. You're praying for the strength to take on all the difficulties that come. I mean, myself, when I got baptized about a year ago, after I got baptized, you know, you expect everything to just get better, right? Your life just comes together after you get baptized. And me and my girlfriend of about a year and a half, we broke up. Uh, I got very sick. Some things happened with my family that weren't great. And it was, this was right after my baptism. And if this was at any other time, I don't know what exactly I would have done with my life and how to handle it and all of that. But because now that I was, my life was changed, I had a way to deal with all the struggles that came into my life. You know, even when things get worse than ever, we now have a way to deal with them. And that's a really powerful thing. You know, in, in the Bible, when the, the female Israelites they're by the Nile River, right? And the, the pharaohs, they come up to them and they say, if there are any males born among you, cast them into the river, cast them into the Nile. And what do these women say? They say, we fear God. That's, that's a really liberating thing. It meant that they feared God more than they feared what the pharaohs were going to do to them. That is how we have to live our lives. There's so many people, all the things that I've talked about today with the lies of the left, with how they want to cancel us, with how they destroy everything that we love. All of this, all of this compounded together. It's a lot of pressure on someone, right? I get that. I get that not everyone's going to be someone who starts making videos or, or goes speaking on shows or being a, a martyr for, for what they believe in, going to all the marches. I get that. But you do have to do something. You do have to stand up for truth. Dennis has a line that is, is one of my favorites. And he says, I, I don't care if you're an optimist or a pessimist, because if you're an optimist, you think things are going to get better, so you just, you don't fight. And if you're a pessimist, you think things are just gonna turn out crappy, so you don't fight. And it's like, I don't care if you're an optimist, a pessimist, just like I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat. I care that you're a fighter. I care that you love good things. I care that even in the face of adversity, you continue to fight. That is what's most important. You know, it, it feels right now for me, I live in, again in Los Angeles, it's a terrible place, absolutely terrible for the most part. And a lot of times it feels like there's not much hope. I'll be honest, there are some days I wake up and I'm struggling and things seem worse than ever in this country and across the world and I see some new headline and things look pretty terrible. But I think back to, you know, again, Dennis likes to talk about D-Day and Normandy and these, these brave men who are younger than me, maybe you know, younger than many of you as well, these American soldiers who said, we are going to get on these boats. They're these tiny metal boats. It's got about 12 to 15 of these men in them, right? And they're going to Germany, or they're going to, to Normandy to, to face the Germans, a country they've never been to before in their life. And the door opens, and they're immediately getting shot by German machine guns, right? Uh, the, 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 their best friend who they've known for years, the door opens, he gets shot in the head, he's dead. They're literally peeing their pants as they are getting off these boats to go onto the beaches of Normandy. Do you think that these, these men had much hope? I don't think so. I don't think they had much hope at all. But they got off those boats anyway. And they took that damn beach. If those men can die for my right to live, then I have to live fighting for every single thing that they died for. That is where we are in America today, that even if, and, and just around the world, that even if it feels like there is no hope and this religion of leftism is creeping in every single facet of our society and we don't know what to do, that is no excuse for not fighting. And I hope that all of you guys will continue to fight with me. Thank you guys and God bless you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that that wasn't too America focused, but I, I, found, I thought it would be interesting. You know, you guys might not know a whole lot about it. I would love to tell you. So I guess now we're gonna be doing some Q and A. So if anyone has questions, I guess just raise your hand. Is that how we wanna do it? Got it. 
Oh, OK. There's a microphone. Thank God I could take my mask off. Uh, Should have done it sooner. Yeah, it's a good thing. So basically, you, I was watching. I've been watching PragerU for quite some time, and you're basically going on a crusade in U.S. universities. Uh -huh. And I have two questions. One quick one, and I want it to be inspiring. Basically, you had terrible experiences in university campuses, but can you tell me one story that was really inspiring and motivating for you that you realized that? Maybe there's a minority of conservative students on campus, but there might be some kind of strong core in one. This is question number one. And question number two is related to religion. What made you decide to turn towards religion? And what advice would you have for people who would like to turn to religion in their late 20s, or just not at the early stage of life, but later on? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. For the first question, he was asking about any heartwarming stories at universities. A few and far between, I, I will be honest. But I will say, for my book tour, I did an event in, um, where was it? In Mississippi. And I did this event in Mississippi, which is a very southern state, even though it's being taken over by leftism. Southern states in America are usually more conservative. And I met this girl who was from Venezuela. And she came up to me, said that she emigrated to the, the United States. And she loved my videos. She loved PragerU. She was going to run for her local school board in Mississippi and try and change the standards there. And you know, Dennis Prager gave me a piece of advice. It was one of the greatest pieces of advice that I've ever been given. And it was that treat every single speech like it's the most important speech of your life. Because there could be 10 people here at this event right now that I'm talking to, or there could be 10,000. I did an event last weekend for 50,000 people in Washington, DC, against the mandates in America. It doesn't matter how many people are there. I'm going to treat it just as important, because you have no idea who you will influence in that audience. And so that's been the, the greatest thing, to be able to go to those universities and, and change people's minds and, and have them wake up or feel bold enough and brave enough to stand up for themselves. I get people messaging me every single day telling me that you know, my videos or my book or any of the stuff that I do has, has changed their life. And I don't mean that to say that to be vain. I, I mean it in a, a good way, that, that having good influences on people can do so much good. If we can all be that good influence on other people to let them know that it's okay to stand up for what we believe in, we can do a lot of good. In terms of, of getting into Christianity, it's, again, Christianity is not supposed to be an easy thing. Lots of people think that it's supposed to be like a social club, you know, come in and get your bagels and your coffee. Like that's Christianity to people, but it's hard. It's very difficult. It's difficult to live by the tenets of the Bible. It's a hard thing to do. And so that's the first step is, is knowing that it's not just something to, to mess around with. It's a real legit thing. And so just like I did when I came to Christ, and it's, it's reading the actual Bible and making sure that you have the understanding that you have to make a choice. After information is presented to you, it doesn't matter if it's religion, politics, anything, you have to make a choice that, okay, I have to either accept this as truth or I have to deny it. And so once you read the Bible and you take it in, you have to make that choice and either accept it as truth or deny it. And so that is the step. And know that it's not going to be easy. It's very difficult. But God willing, it's very worth it. Thank you. You posted a dichotomy and leftism, leftist as being evil. Mm -hmm. There isn't anything that you've said that I disagree with, first of all. Right. Um, but my question to you concerns numbers of people who we can say loosely are on the left who don't consider themselves evil right on the one hand absolutely don't and on the other hand you can meet them at a party or something a totally non-political situation and they are good people there are people in my family who are unavowedly leftist. Mm -hmm. I can't call them evil people, and I don't consider them evil. I want another hook in. I want another way in other than that black, black and white mm -hmm. dichotomy. And I think it would be helpful if there were that. Sure. Thank okay. you. 
No, listen, you, you, you bring up a good point. Obviously, when you're going and talking about things that aren't so political with people who are leftists, you know, you're talking about going out to eat, you know, unless they want to go to some nasty fast food restaurant, they're probably not that evil, you know, but not the ideas, the ideas are what are evil. And I think that many of the people who profess the ideas of leftism do not have good intentions when they are professing them. I think that I actually got into a big debate about this on my show with my co-host about this exact same topic and that, you know, there, there, there's an article of truth that if you know what you are speaking is true, then you are standing up for what is good. And even if it's hard, you're standing up for what is good. If you're standing up for lies, which leftism, the things that they believe in, they are lies, then you are standing up for something evil. And it is hard to say that those are for good intentions. Like when it comes to the abortion debate, myself, I don't know exactly the politics of abortion in this country, but for myself, you know, I'm unapologetically pro-life in, in everything that I do. And to hear that there are people who are leftists who are fine with aborting a child after it has been born or up to nine months is something that is evil to me. And so even if we think that this person doesn't have evil intentions, the idea that they believe in is evil, right? It's like, you know, you know the, the, the ninth commandment, bear no false witness, you know? It's like not telling lies, essentially, is what that means. And I'm sure that you had, you had Nazis that were, you know, in their own personal lives, they, they went home to their wives and they went to church or maybe they even did community service, right? They were doing fine things in their community, but they were committing evil acts. And they were convinced that the evil things that they were doing were actually good. And so even if the person is not inherently going out and saying, oh, I'm going to kill all the conservatives and I hate all these people and I'm an evil person, you know, that's obviously, we're not characterizing people. But what we do know is that the ideas are evil. And even if they think they're doing it for good, it does not mean that we do not call out the ideas as evil when we see it. Thank you. Um, Canadian, teaching in an international school, Christian international school here in Budapest. Cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, Trudeau, yeah, he just yeah. tested positive for COVID today. Did he? Uh-huh. Okay. You're Don't clap. Man. Okay. Don't clap. Yeah. yeah. Um, just question. Um, some people might, my kids would use the term spicy um, in reference to maybe some of the videos you've done. So I have two questions. Sure. Number one, you ever regretted anything and rethought maybe some of the tactics that you use in regards to how you confront people? That would be question number one. Question number two, um, you've identified leftism, but I'm wondering if you could comment maybe on the role of secularism, mm -hmm. maybe that's driving the leftism, and maybe creating problems on both sides of the political spectrum, yep. and secondly, extreme individualism. Um, I'm just wondering if that's kind of underlying maybe even bigger problem than the leftism. You know, extreme, you know, I'm reading a book right now, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, excellent book, mm -hmm. highly recommend it. Yep. And, and really the author is saying, look, we're, we got problems in our society. It's, it's not necessarily the pot politics, it's the extreme individualism. And he dates it back to Rousseau and, and so on. Right. Um, so yeah, those will be my two questions. Thank you. Got it. I'll try and remember the questions as best as I can. <laughs> in terms of the first one, there are of course things that I wish, you know, maybe I could have asked a question a little bit better or done something differently. but. I live with no regrets in the ways that I carried out my videos. I think that ever since I started my videos, I have done it talking to people as the pinnacle purpose was always to change minds versus make content that was just going to say, ha ha, stupid liberal. I wanted to change minds. So even if we did it in ways that made people look a little bit, a little bit stupid at times, it was a way to expose the left to a greater audience. Like one of the videos that, I, that uh, was, was a lot of people's favorite is when I dressed up as a Mexican. And I went around UCLA and I asked white students what they thought of my outfit. And of course, they were all incredibly offended. I was committing the worst sin. And then I went to Alvera Street, which is a street in, in Los Angeles, full of Mexicans. They're the ones who actually sold me the costume. And they loved the costume, right? So you guys are laughing now, you should watch the video. And, and you know, that, that's sort of a, an abrasive way to do it. I understand that. But we proved a point with that video. That's why that video has been seen over 20 million times. Because we proved a point that the left and what they say about cultural appropriation is without a doubt, undeniably incorrect. That they are wrong. They are wrong. 
And so even though some of these things, you know, it might not be always the, the prettiest sight, me in a mustache and sombrero is not a pretty sight for sure, it was effective. And so I, I, for all my videos, for what it's worth, I'm very proud of the way that I did all of them. In terms of, of secularism with leftism, Yes, that you are exactly right, because leftism fills the hole that Christianity has left. So as secularism brews inside the West, inside America, all these different places, you will find that leftism takes over as a dominant religion because it gives people a, a type of meaning for their lives. Climate change, uh, the COVID pandemic, racism, trans theory, any of this kinds of stuff. It gives people a sort of meaning that they are lacking. And so secularism is the issue but secularism just on its own isn't necessarily as bad until you have the leftism that is added onto it. And the leftism is what destroys millions of people. It is what killed 100 million people in the 20th century. It is that what does it. So the secularism is the, the catalyst and then the leftism drives the evil that comes through it. Make sense? Thank you. So my question would be that as I, as I can see now, there is a shift in in the way of power being achieved in the world to a technological field. So like the AI and metaverse and everything. And what do you think about the future of, of the, the truth and how truth could be achieved through these uh, um, fields, uh, even though most of the companies that rule it are, are drived by uh, seeking the truth? Thank you for the question. Elon Musk just won Times Person of the Year, and I saw a lot of conservatives coming out and cheering on Elon Musk. You know, Elon Musk comes and does a podcast about wokeness and, and says, you know, wokeness is kind of bad, and every conservative is bending over backwards now for Elon Musk. Elon Musk this, Elon Musk that. He's the greatest thing in, since sliced bread. And it's like the things that Elon Musk is talking about behind the scenes are things that are what I would consider evil, the, the Neuralink, the AI, the things that they are developing within his company to not just make humans able to, to survive medically, but to enhance humanity. You know, this is a, an anti-biblical prospect that they want to take humans and make them better, intelligent-wise, strength-wise, all these types of things. If a war veteran gets his leg torn off, and you're able to repair his leg through bionics, to me that seems like an okay thing. But when you are coming in and saying, we want to put chips inside of your brain so that you can communicate with other people and get rid of many of the human interactions that we have had for, for centuries, to me that seems to be an evil thing. The metaverse, all the new technology. I mean, I grew up in Denver, Colorado, and Denver, Colorado used to be a very quaint, classy place to live. It was a small town feel, it was really nice, and now Denver has exploded once they legalized weed for people, uh, and it's turned into this, this modern, technocratic type of city. And you can see that although you can now, you know, you can load up your phone and you can watch porn anytime you want, you can order food to your house whenever, you can have, you know, go on Tinder and you never have to go to a bar or a restaurant or a church to meet a woman, all of these things, it might seem like it is easy, it is easier to have all of this, but in reality, it destroys human interaction. It makes it so that the unique things that I would have with you or you or any of you people doesn't mean anything if it can just be emulated by a chip in our brain or a screen. And so because of that, I don't think that these technologies can produce truth through them. I think they can only make people into worse people. Thank you. Hi, Will. Nice to see you here in Hungary. Uh, this question might be a little bit provocative for you, but I'm um, Bring it. interested in your answer. Uh, so um, I am really interested about your um, answer about uh, certain people in the, in the MAGA movement. I mean, um, there, are certain, there are certain people like uh, MAGA lady. I don't know if you're familiar with her. MAGA lady. Mega Lady and uh, Caitlyn Jenner, uh, who announced a few years ago that uh, he or she would run for governor of uh, California. Uh, how can uh, conservatives say that they are against the LGBTQ plus ideology, but they will calmly um, 
say that, yeah, welcome to the MAGA movement, you are part of one. And for me, it seems like that uh, the MAGA movement tries to get people together uh, for the purpose of defeating the left. That's a great question. I actually met Lady MAGA at an event in Utah. Dennis and I were doing a joint event, event together, and he came up and did a picture with us and everything. It was very awkward, I, I will say. But listen, conservatives right now, like we had, uh, you guys know Barry Weiss is? Barry Weiss was a journalist for the New York Times. And she went on Bill Maher last week, and she came and said, oh, this COVID pandemic has to end. And again, conservatives are bending over for this liberal for saying something that is kind of conservative, right? Con our, our, our footing culturally is so weak as conservatives, especially in America, that we will take anything we can get. And so when we see someone who's trans or gay or whatever, we're going to come and say, well, you know, the left, they're the real transphobes. We're the ones who really support these people because they want to pander to the same types of people. The, 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 the people on the right are, are even worse than the left sometimes because at least the left, they're like honest about their pandering where the, le the right is like trying to outdo the left. So yeah, these people who, who come in and support this and say, oh, this is fine, and it's a, conservatism is a, a big tent type of conservatism, it's all, it's lies. It's lies, because they're doing it for their own personal gain. I mean, we can find better candidates in California for governor, we already did, Larry Elder, you know, no doubt we had better candidates, but people are so tired, conservatives are so tired of being called transphobic, racist, sexist by the left over and over again, that they'll take some transgender and say, well, let's run them for governor because they have an R next to their name apparently now, even though their voting record would show exactly the opposite. And so that culture has just turned us into a very weak culture of conservatives. And so I think that if we want to win as conservatives, we say no to the big tent, and we say yes to the truth and the things that we know to be right. So, but there is a growing movement of that in, in conservative politics in America. You hear a lot about these Lady Maga and, and Caitlyn Jenner and those types of things. That, that is a wing of more of, I guess, the GOP type of establishment conservative versus much of the kind of new right that is evolving, you know, so, yeah. Uh, my question would be, how can we fight against left leftism most effectively? How can you fight against leftism most actively? Effectively. The number one thing you can do, like I said before, not everyone in here is going to come and be a, a PragerU speaker, tra international speaker now, traveling across the world and doing this. You know, it's, it, it's a big deal. But the number one thing that you can do is grassroots changing minds, okay? I'll tell you a story. The reason why I am where I am today is because when I was going through college as a sophomore in college, my second year, I still wasn't really that political. I was getting into it a little bit more and trying to figure it out, but I didn't know too much. And there was this girl in my class who I'd never met before, and she had a Donald Trump pin on her backpack. This was back in 2016, 2015, 2016. And for some reason, she came up to me and said, who are you voting for? I said, I don't know you, why are you talking to me, you know? But we get to talking a little bit and, and she's like, oh, here's why I'm voting for Trump and I didn't really know much at the time. And eventually I, I, I came to realize that, wow, America's in a lot different place than I thought that it was because of this one girl coming up and talking to me. And so this girl coming up and talking to me spurred me to go and research things about the election, about conservatism, find out about PragerU, find out about all these different organizations that I was able to work with. And it's because one girl came up and talked to me, right? I'm not saying that the next person that you go and talk to is going to be the next Will Witt, right? They don't have as good of hair. But they could be someone that is going to make changes wherever they are. And you have no idea who you can influence when you are going and talking to people. So in the individual conversations, it might seem scary to go talk to your, your aunt who's 50 and never married and just drinks wine at all the family dinners or that kid in your class who, who, who has blue hair. I mean, it might be intimidating to talk to these people, but the intimidating conversations are the ones that we have to have if we want to win. It's no longer about just being okay and, and tolerant with evil. No, we are not tolerant to evil. We want to defeat evil. And to do that, we have to convince as many people as we can what is good as much as we can. So, yes, thank you.
It, you can hear me, right? Yeah, now it's good. So um, I very much agree with um, most of the things you said. Um, I'm a Christian conservative, actually Calvinist. So unlike some of the leading figures in the in the in the government, I do hold these values. Um, I just recently completed my master's at LSE. So the things you said are very much resonated to my experiences. And I do see the things you fought with. I also had some debates, actually very long debates. And you know, the title, it's all nice, but what you say that leftism is evil, I'm not sure if it's effective. You just had the, the last question, was the most effective uh, way to fight leftism? I think if we say that leftism is, is evil, you know, it's counterproductive. It's kind of saying that what they say, the cancel culture, this is our way, the conservative way of, of, of cancel culture. So, and it contributes actually to the escalation of the public debate. So wouldn't you think that maybe sort of a, a more a sort of a more effective narrative would be to have to find the middle balance because like this you're not going to sit on the table where those things are actually decided and uh, i also tell a lot what you said when you entered hungary you saw the the family that hungary supports families that's that's amazing thing you know but the same thing goes with the hungarian government if they would have the right narrative the right communication we wouldn't have as much fights with the eu and with other entities and it would be much more effective Saying that, you know, this all connects to, to my previous question. Right. I see exactly what you're saying. And I think that that is exactly what the left would want us to do. I think that Hungary getting so much flack from people and the government getting so much flack is because Viktor Orban and the Hungarian government are standing up for something and being unflinching about it. Right? Because the left would love it if we just said, oh, let's find common ground. You know? Because what's common ground? Oh, well, let's put... Uh, transgender stuff in every single classroom. Oh, but conservatives say, oh, it's only up to eight years old, where the left wants it as six years old, right? And that's the kind of middle ground that conservatives have always come to with the left. We've, we've, secede, we've ceded every single cultural position on this, on this basis of middle ground. And because of that, we've lost everything. So I would love to have this type of middle ground type of deal. But, you know, I mean, think back to, to the communists. Did they have middle ground? They had no middle ground. You know, communism is evil. I'm going to say, is that controversial? I mean, to come out and say communism is evil, those, those ideas led to 100 million people dying. I'm not here to find middle ground with communists. I'm here to destroy communists. That's what I'm doing, right? So if the ideas are evil, I'm not going to sit back and say, oh, I, I'm going to find middle ground with people. What I will do, which is important that you brought up, is that individuals, I wrote on, my entire book is about this. My entire book, every single chapter is 17 different chapters on different political and cultural topics, which gives people the questions, the persuasion tactics, and the facts that they can use to change people's minds, change individuals' minds. And it's been very successful. It, 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 is, it is a wonderful thing. And so I, I believe in, in, in more than anyone else that you can have individual conversations and anyone can be saved. I mean, I, I was a liberal. I was an atheist. Now I'm speaking in Hungary about destroying communism, you know? It's a, it's a big deal. My, my co-host on my show, Amala, she has a Black Lives Matter tattoo on her arm. You know, as she used to work for leftist organizations in Florida, and now she's, she's speaking as a conservative in, in California. You know, so anyone's mind can be changed, and you can have, you do need to have those conversations. But as an ideology, I will not sit here and, and mince meat about you know, let's try and find middle ground with these ideas. There is no middle ground. They want total dominion and destruction of the way that we live. And they've had it before, and I will never let that happen again. Thank you. Okay, well, thank yeah. you. Thank you, yeah, ask it again. So my question was, how can you debate people who are not believe in the Bible about homosexuality and trans issue and such things? Because you cannot really have any opposing arguments that are not based on the Bible. Thank you. Right. I think if I'm, if I'm understanding your question, I, I will say this, that a lot of it comes down to strategy, right? In that you're able to have the facts about the Bible, about, about homosexuality, whatever it is that you're talking about, you have the facts that you are doing, but you're able to weave them into questions. I can't tell you how important this is. I imagine if I'm going up to someone and saying, climate change isn't that big of a deal, right? Versus going up to someone and saying, well, why do you think the earth only has 12 years left? Right? That opens up a debate in a much different way. 
And so when you are going and talking to people about any of these different topics and asking, asking them for their opinion, it is much better to put them on the defense where they are having to answer your questions instead of putting them on the offense where they are just trying to blurt out the next fact. And this works very well with biblical topics, you know, especially when you know your scripture and you're asking them, have you heard of this? Have you heard of, of this verse? Have you heard, you know, of, of this that this actually, you know, corresponds to, to this in our modern day culture, right? And you can use those questions instead of coming and saying, you know, God hates gay people or something, you know, it's, like, it's obviously a terrible thing to say. You're coming and asking a question to the person and saying, hey, can you explain this? It's a much better way, a much better way to do the tactic. So it's just about weaving the facts that you want to ask into questions to change minds. So, and that's what I've been doing for years now. So, thank you. I got to defend Elon Musk a little, not that he needs it, but uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Red Mars by Kim Stanley Robinson, uh -huh. the Mars trilogy. Uh, it's a very, it's a, it's a heavy kind of thing. And there's a guy named William Ford, who is one of the, there are transnational companies basically running the world in the, in the book, which was written about 30 years ago. So he, he was a, he's a prophet. And one of, the, one of the leaders of one of the companies is William Ford, who is totally different from the others. And he actually kind of changes the world in a sense. And, I, and I'm not the only one who sees Elon Musk as a kind of person like that. He's, he's definitely a visionary and all. And, uh, and I think he has come so far from where he used to be. And now he's, I mean, he's a diehard, devoted, straightforward, right, center right, whatever you want to call it, Republican type of guy. But he's very careful not to go too far. And he is, you know, he's followed by tens of millions of people. And I think we really, really need people like him to, in the movement, because with all due respect, not just to you, but to Dennis, whom I've met, and he's a great guy and all. But we do need people like Elon Musk who can actually speak to the non-converted in a, in a very flamboyant, very casual way that they listen to him. And kind of connecting to, to this is that when you said, uh, we, you know, we don't, we don't want to, we're really skeptical of, of people who are like Caitlyn Jenner, which is true. I mean, he or she is, is complete bullshit. But as, as opposed to that, people like Milo Yiannopoulos, who was really deplatformed in the past years, and, and on, which is very unfortunate, but he was, I mean, he's gay. He was openly gay. He was very nonchalant about it. But he was, in his views, he was, I think he was as straightforward and as, as strong as any of us in, in denouncing the trans movement, calling trans people actually, you know, crazy in their minds. And, and Milo is one of those guys who, on the surface, we would kind of, you know, distance ourselves from because he is, because of his lifestyle and all. But I think the world is not just not black and white. And just like Elon Musk, we also need people like, like Milo, who will call them, you know, little agents in the, in, in the leftist bubbles right. where they can actually yep. do a lot of harm there. Yeah, I get, I get your point exactly. No one is like a clean slate of just, oh, this person's 100% evil, 100% bad. What I want people to realize is that someone like Elon Musk, when I'm talking about him, is I don't just want conservatives to come and start giving him all of the praises just because they heard one thing. I agree with you. He's doing a lot of good things for a lot of people. I totally agree with that. But if people don't know the full holistic picture of everything that's happening, I think that it's an unfair characterization of people. So what I want people to know, again, is the truth. I want them to know this is what this person believes on this. This is what they believe on this. I, I, I'm kind of, you know, there's the idea now that you, you have to hate someone if they disagree with one part of what you, dis, what you believe in, right? And that's completely wrong. If Elon Musk could, has some things that I don't really agree with that I think are pretty bad, but then has done some good things, I'll say the good things when they're good things, right? And the bad things when they're bad. So I just want everyone to be able to have a, a holistic view of the truth and say, okay, now I can make my, uh, my own mind about this person once I know everything instead of what just conservative media is trying to feed me because they're jumping on the first thing that they can get. You know what I mean? So that's kind of what it's about. And Milo Yiannopoulos, actually funny enough, when I was in college at Boulder, we brought him to my school. So that was my first event I ever did. And I went to my teacher because she said, if you write a paper on a political event that you go to, you get extra credit for the class. And I was failing my class, so I thought this is a great way to get my grade up. So I wrote a paper on, on the Milo Yiannopoulos event, and she said, this doesn't count. And she said, well, there's a Keystone Pipeline protest going on 
you could go to that. And that cemented my idea to drop out of college. So anyway, thank you. It's a little bit like I'm the, I'm the reverse you because I live in the US. I'm originally from Hungary. Uh -huh. So we had the chance to meet in LA on the Pro Israel Rally with Mr. Prager. So first of all, it's an honor to see you here. And when you say you are too American, whenever I speak in, in, in the US, I'm too Hungarian. I'm bringing my Hungarian jokes, my accent, and nobody gets anything. But what's really interesting is, and I need your help there because you are American. So we need to see how we can change the minds there. Whenever I go to speak on college campuses and my topic should be Zionism, I end up talking about socialism and communism because when they hear that I'm from Hungary, they are like, oh, communism is something to strive for. You guys really, you know, had it good. And this happened at Columbia University in New York City. And I was like, really? So I end up with my half speech talking about how my dad has, you know, the files on him today, that he can go and check who was spying on him and who was reporting on him. And it, it is really scary when you see these Ivy League college campuses, you know, being indoctrinated with this kind of mindset. And we talk a lot about education, but what I came to realize that education is nice, but as long as we personally don't change or the teachers don't change, we educate the same thing all over again. Like I was an anti-Semite, today I talk about how not to be an anti-Semite and why Zionism is not a curse word. But I needed to go through my own personal journey on this. So the same is in the US, as long as those people don't have an experience, like you said, it's the first time you ever left the country and you were ever in Hungary. Now you're gonna go back and you're gonna have a different perspective. Yep. But how do we achieve this with people who don't have the chance you know, to, to have this journey themselves, to come to Hungary, to talk with someone who went through communism? Because it is so dangerous. Like I live in a New York City, so whatever you say. And just one thing that you learn something about this culture and something is, that is my returning cultural shock whenever I go back to the US is your first amendment right. Like we don't have that here. Like you cannot deny Holocaust in this country. You cannot have hate speech and not have consequences. So maybe that's a question to you. What do you think about your first amendment rights and whether that is something that is actually a cool thing and, and it's not harmful at the end of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you. I love the First Amendment. Yes, I'm very, very proud of that part of America. I think that it's the, the pinnacle of what makes America the way that it is. Uh, I, I think that without it, you would have people dictating whoever's in power at the time, who is dictating what is hate speech, what is not allowed, and then the next person who comes in changes it and changes the standards. So yes, I'm very pro First Amendment. You know, it's the, the classic line of, was it Voltaire of, of uh, was it that I don't agree with what you're saying, but I die for your right to say it, right? That's kind of the American liberal democracy spirit of that. And I think that's an amazing thing. I think that having that First Amendment. In terms of your, your other question about convincing people who might not be able to go to Hungary or see communism firsthand, I will tell you it's a very difficult thing. You know, if you with my book and going out and talking to people on campus on all sorts of stuff or on the streets, I mean, if I'm batting 500, I guess you guys wouldn't get the baseball term, huh? <laughs> if I'm convincing half of the people on something, I'm having a very good day, right? 50%. So I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, there's a, a tried and true method that's going to work every time. But I think the best thing you can do, like I was telling him, is, is the questions and educating them. It's a non-confrontational way that you are going up to people and talking to them about communism. Instead of coming up to them and saying, well, communism killed 100 million people, go up to them and say, what is communism? You know, and you can even start off a conversation so simply because most people don't even know. When I go and talk to people and say, what is socialism? They say, oh, that's equality, right? I say, yeah, equality, everyone's equally dead. You know, that's, that's what it is. So uh, just basic questions and being able to do it in a non-confrontational way is the best way for you to educate people and wake them up. And you can lead it into where you want to go, but you know, there's no secret sauce. That's just... It takes time and it takes practice. So thank you. Hi. Uh, you said something which is that you, you want to stand up for the truth, um, whether it's um, whatever the consequences, and I really uh, appreciate that. I'm wondering how, how, do you, um, how would you define, how do you find out the truth? So to take one example, you mentioned that you were um, 
saying something about, I think, uh, COVID and uh, the mask and what is efficient or not or what should be done. Right. And I guess this was a very political issue apparently in the US and not necessarily in other countries. So I just wonder, like, how do you see what is the, the source of the truth? How do you know what to stand up for? It's a very good question. It gets into kind of a epistemological argument and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's a little heady. But what I can say is that for me personally, this is why my baptism was so important. Because if you read the Bible and you understand the scripture and you know what is true within scripture, then you will know what is true. You know, obviously Jesus wasn't getting COVID vaccines on his fourth booster, but you know, all of the things that are within the Bible will give you the answers for how you are supposed to respond to all of these things in life. And so despite not having all the answers in there, specifics on what we know, you can look to scripture and it has all of the answers that we need. You know, I know that's not the, the easiest way to answer the question, but again, Christianity is hard. Looking for truth is hard. Actually going into the scripture and diving into your problems is a difficult thing to do. I know that when I'm struggling with things, that's what I do. You know, I, I'm, I'm praying about it and looking to scripture to help myself and find out what's actually true and wonder whether or not I'm making the right decisions. So look to God, look to scripture, and that's where you'll find your truth. Thank you so much, everyone. This is truly remarkable. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say two things. One is that I was supposed to have asked you to wear your masks uh, during the course of this uh, in accordance with the regulations. Uh, well, I'm afraid I simply forgot to do that, but it doesn't matter, you did so anyway. Um, now, the second is to thank uh, Will very much indeed on behalf of the Institute. Uh, the fact is you raised um, a lot of extraordinarily um, important moral and political and ethical questions, as well as simply the, the issues of the day. Um, we're obviously going to have to go away and debate a lot of these, and obviously we'd like to get you back again. Uh, obviously we recognize there's a difference between uh, discussing with a man what he should do in his own life to make himself a better person, and discussing with him what you're going to say to the British voter or the Hungarian voter or the American voter in an election, and the different kinds of debate, discussion, and cooperation. Um, and we need to really examine those questions very strongly in order, in all of the cases, to speak with truth. So um, having said that, I want to thank you for doing so this evening. Most grateful. Thank you. Thank you.